Did you know that the Supreme Court recently admitted a public interest litigation which seeks to put a ban on political parties offering freebies during elections to lure voters? And did you know the Election Commission of India is proposing that the political parties be forced to disclose the means through which they will fund such freebies. Hello and welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus. I am your host Anil Padmanabhan. Little over a week ago, the Election Commission of India set in motion the general election cycle to elect the 18th Lok Sabha. It also set the stage for poll promises. This year though, poll promises has got a new moniker, guarantees. The Congress party announced this Panch Nyai, which among other things includes a host of populist measures. The Bharti Janata Party, on the other hand, despite facing two-term anti-incumbency, has taken a different tack. It is preferring to showcase its record in office to make a claim of five years of unprecedented prosperity. How do these two guarantees stack up? Does the Bharti Janata Party's move to opt for a less populist influenced manifesto signal a fundamental change in the way elections are fought in this country? To answer this and more, we spoke to Haseeb Drabu. He is an economist, former finance minister of Jammu and Kashmir and someone who is extremely outspoken. I began by asking Haseeb on his thoughts on the Congress guarantees which were largely populist in nature, especially since they could be costly to the exchequer. Well, the first thought is where does this guarantee come from? So, I mean, it's obviously in uh, re reaction to the Modi guarantee, right? So, I think the first victory has been scored there itself in terms of the optics of it. And what even in terms of communicating it, that Panch Nyai, Congress had in 1975 in the regime of Indira Gandhi worked out a 20-point program which was reviewed in 78 and then 84 and that became the kind of model and had very sensible stuff like what has been happening over the last three, four years, five years is water for everybody and safety for everybody. All that was there apart from any program. So why have they abandoned the 20 point program to now restructure it as a panch nyai? It's so obviously in relation to the overall environment that has been created by the BJP. So that I think the first thing that one that comes to my mind is that why have they have done this. So obviously there is immense amount of pressure, so to say, to come on. So the first civilizational agenda, which was which which has been a strong part of the Modi budgeting, has now been accepted by Congress. So that's the first part that comes by. Second is that in terms of how does this sit with public expenditure policy? I think there's a very fine line, Anil, that you need to draw between a freebie and a welfare scheme. To the extent that the public expenditure policy and structure of the government is welfare oriented, even freebies should qualify for welfare expenditure because the overall number, let's say today, the government of India is going to spend about 50 lakh crores. If all these schemes for welfare of people are a part of that and they're not outside, so then they qualify to be a welfare spending. What is happening here? is that you're not looking at it as a part of public expenditure policy at all. You are looking at it as something that comes from outside and that is what distorts the budget, the budgetary balance, the fiscal issues come up. So one has to see it, how it sits with the public expenditure framework. Haseeb is making a very important distinction here. He's saying that any welfare measures which come through the budget are implicitly within fiscal guardrails. On the other hand, what the Congress is promising is outside the budget. If implemented, therefore, it will cost the exchequer over and above what has been budgeted. It could well 
undo the fiscal gains that have been achieved over the last decade. What has happened so far in the last five, seven years is that all these welfare spendings have become a part of the public expenditure policy. In fact, the major shift after 2014, if you notice, is that public expenditure is more on the current side than on the capital side which has its own macroeconomic consequences, but they were very much a, a design of the public expenditure policy. Whereas in the earlier regime, in 70s, in 80s, a dominant part of public expenditure was public investment. So what I'm trying to say is also it fits with the kind of overall economic policy of the BJP, and it doesn't fit with the overall policy, public expenditure policy of the Congress. And that is why it is something that we need to understand as to what are the implications of this on, on the fiscal balance of the country. So just to add to what you just said, Haseep, uh, they are also, in a way, institutionalizing giveaways, like creating a permanent commission on loan waivers, farm loan waivers. So this is like uh, uh, good politics, bad economics, or bad politics and bad economics. I mean, I think it would be bad politics and bad economics, because, you know, what you're trying to, when you say you're institutionalizing uh, this, it does create a moral hazard. If you have a permanent council for, uh, you know, loan waivers, then there's a very strong moral hazard on this because then the incentive to pay is reduced to the extent of, or you are discriminating against those who are actually uh, repaying all the farm loans or whatever. If it's a one-time issue, one can understand that there could be uh, hangovers of the environment, whether it's COVID, post-COVID, floods, draw, whatever. There is a, there, there does arise need to reassess and see if we can do that. But to make it a permanent commission actually is not a, is not a, is, is not a great idea because it, it will build into the system a certain level of default, and then you will have at the because today you are looking at it from two perspectives: one the central government and one the state governments. Then there is huge competitive state you know politics that happens across states. So you now see for the first time. I mean, I, I found it very very uh, you know serious is that uh, Kerala has gone to the Supreme Court uh, against the central government for borrowings. Now, is the is the judiciary going to decide the fiscal policy of the of the states or the center? So, in fact, that's a nice segue into my follow-up question. Because let's take Kerala, exchequer, which is severely damaged, which is why they want more borrowings. So, go back to this Congress guarantee. I just want to take one example, and especially to you, because you're a former finance minister, so you know the costs that uh, hits the exchequer with such huge giveaways. So if we take the one lakh for every woman, one woman in every poor family, we are talking just about a larger metric, 800 million people in this country get free food grains, which means we are talking about 400 million people broadly. So you're talking about 4 lakh crore, which is four times the average annual Mandrega spend. Is this really sustainable and it'll kind of blow a huge hole in the uh, national exchequer? For sure. But come from a pure, since you kind of invoked my experience as a finance minister, what it will do is it will make a large part of your budget sticky. So your policy maneuverability is reduced. Now, even I'm not even looking at right now the fiscal balance. Assume for a moment that any form of public expenditure will actually bring in more incomes from a pure plate macro perspective. That whether I spend a rupee here or there, it goes into the system, generates its own impulses. So there'll be growth, there'll be better incomes and whatever else. But what it does is to reduce my flexibility as a finance minister in terms of allocating for where there is need to create capacities to build infrastructure. So it eats away into that because this now becomes a fixed cost. And to take it out of the system will be far more difficult than to institutionalize it. Nobody else, because the politics is such, because you're now actually doing a quid pro quo, that I will give you this, you give me your votes. It will be very difficult to change the system which actually will result in the complete collapse of the fiscal architecture at the state level. Center still has flexibilities in terms of, you know, uh, trying to fund these. States are very, very limited. So what you will do is you will cut um, critical expenditure for this expedient expenditure. 
which I think is where the damage will happen. And you will never be able to create a fiscal balance which ensures that, which is growth oriented. So you will, you perhaps will create a consumption oriented thing, which will then have consequent impacts on the, the inflation and interest rates and so on and so forth, which will then make the system implode far more. And given the fact that states today are spending more than collectively than the center, the magnitude of the problem is far, far greater. What do we make of this Modi ka guarantee slogan? Basically, the National Democratic Alliance or NDA is preferring to showcase its record in office, especially its ability to deliver welfare on scale and use that as their claim to provide unprecedented prosperity to India over the next five years. The critical difference between the two at this point of time, as I see it, is that BJP has started leveraging money, government money, rather than just disbursing government money. And it's an important point that you need to understand. This is, this is what corporates do. When you do a project of, let's say, 100 rupees, you are leveraging your equity of 30 rupees. So on a base of 30, you create a corpus of 100. That is exactly what has been the strategy of the last four or five budgets. You are leveraging a fixed amount for a much larger uh, expenditure pool. Whereas by doing these one uh, item oriented, these are actually disbursements. They don't leverage money. So if I were to compare the two setups, to fulfill the Modi guarantee, I will need only 30 bucks. Whereas to fulfill the other guarantee, I'll need 100 bucks. So there's no leveraging happening in the second part. And that, I think, is where uh, the, the game will lie, is because you're not putting the entire onus on the government. You are trying to create a setup which will generate incomes and then further it and meet your targets, whether they are of uh, you know welfare or others. You are creating that corpus through leveraging of resources that the government has. Whereas in this, which is, again, why you would tend to call this a more of a freebie, because it is doing the full underwriting of, of those expenses. I think that's the critical difference. Not so much anything else in terms of the larger ideological thing. I, I think you're so right because uh, when you say leveraging, what this government has done in terms of expenditure is targeting. And they have done this using this kind of economic GPS, Jandan, Aadhaar, Mobile, identified the uh, beneficiary. And the savings are about 3 lakh crore cumulatively. Now, my question is that this is based on a principle, this whole uh, targeting. The principle being that only the beneficiary should get and the mechanism is the economic GPS. It has also led to a political harvest for the NDA, which we have seen, particularly if you look at cohort of women, uh, they have been the major beneficiary of most of these schemes. Do you agree? Oh, yes, without doubt. Absolutely. No question about that. That you, the, you know, you Also, you are ignoring that it did not all have originated from BJP. That's being very unfair. This is today built on what is possible today in terms of targeting is largely because of one initiative which was taken by the previous government under Manmohan Singh, which is Aadhaar. Now, how you have leveraged Aadhaar, you can take credit for it for the BJP government. But the fact that you created that system, let's recognize that also. I mean, it's not all black and black and white. The fact is that there are shades of gray in this because system building had happened. Aadhaar was created. Aadhaar enabled you to handle COVID the way you handle. Otherwise, not possible. I took one shot in Bombay, one shot in Srinagar, right? Because of my Aadhaar card. Now, you leverage it very positively there. You are leveraging it here to target beneficiaries. So, technology comes in as a very strong part of that delivery mechanism, which was started off uh, during the previous regime. So to that extent, yes, I would agree with you that uh, a large part of it is because of more focused targeting deliveries through use of technology and stuff, which has taken it to another level. It has also become very aspirational. See, again, don't ignore the civilizational agenda that has been followed. It has given a new identity and Whereas, the, and that's an aspirational thing. Whereas the ones we're talking of is more quotidian, you know, more uh, basic uh, livelihood issues, which are being addressed. 
so you have what the bjp has done is to create that whole combine the aspirational and the uh, routine into a very powerful instrument so even if it's not fully adequately supplied the aspirational identity comes in and gives you the satisfaction i am moving along take the case of g20 i mean a magnificent way to engage the entire country you may disagree with whatever was done fact is and i have said this so many times that if the same g20 was done under the regime of dr manmohan singh he would have contributed immensely to the agenda of g20 but no involvement would have happened at the country level in fact even i would not even know that they you know that the g20 is happening here you and i went to the back of beyond in my village where i had contested you still saw g20 and everybody thought that you know mr modi has become the leader of g20 which was a rotational issue so it's how you leverage your opportunities is where where the entire success comes whether it is g20 or it's a it's a freebie welfare policy you are leveraging the opportunities that exist today by having created a certain agenda and following it and that's a natural consequence whereas in the other case more like a force fit now if this is happening there is a guarantee being given there then we also give a guarantee i mean i think that's not how how it will work it is that's a very fine line between welfare and uh, freebies and uh, largely that is because uh, with in, in the case of welfare if it is targeted let's take dbt direct benefit transfer it has you know ensured a the benefits reach the people b savings in you know ghost accounts corruption etc so in a way it empowered people right but if you look at freebies let's take karnataka government which is struggling to pay for its guarantees uh, you know they gave a freebie of free bus travel for all women now it included the universal set of women instead of poor women uh, if it had targeted poor women it is a welfare scheme but when it goes this way it becomes a universal scheme where unintended people gain right so do you agree with this uh, hypothesis so, so what i was trying to say in in the beginning i to the extent that these schemes are a part of the overall public expenditure structure and policy it is not a free gift when it comes from outside of your public expenditure policy it becomes a freebie other it's a welfare spending what you are talking of is plumbing that i have done better implementation i have said that is plumbing but conceptually speaking when does a welfare scheme become a freebie when it is not a part of your public expenditure policy when it is not a part of the structure of expenditure which is where i'm saying a decisive shift made by bjp somewhere in 15 16 is to shift the balance from capex driven public expenditure to current driven capex that's when it became a welfare thing and quite cleverly 18 the shift focus shifted back because there was need for public investment to drive which is what post covid particularly became very evident and if you see the last two budgets there has been a heavy component of public investment capital formation capital investment so when an expenditure item is a part of your overall public expenditure policy structure it's a it's a scheme or a welfare scheme but when it comes from outside and distorts this public expenditure policy it becomes a freebie and has a quid pro quo which is linked to a particular event that is elections the general election cycle this year has different overtones to it especially in terms of the promises that are being made by political parties yes you have the conventional style of the congress party and others in lacing their campaign with solid populist promises however as we heard during the course of our conversation today the bjp has opted for a different tack presumably they are inspired by their prime minister's famous remarks of muft ki revdi consequently their strategy is to offer welfare within the fiscal guardrails not beyond it this is a very interesting pivot the cornerstone or the mantra as it were is that that there are no free lunches food for thought thank you for watching don't forget to subscribe to strat news global on youtube hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates and please do share your thoughts ideas and suggestions with us i'm available on twitter at capital calculus i'll be back next week with another episode Till then stay safe